What's it going to be then, eh? The International Anthony Burgess Foundation Podcast Episode 5 A Clockwork Orange Clockwork Orange, set in the near future, tells the story of Alex, the teenage leader of a violent gang of droogs. It follows him as he beats, robs and rapes citizens of an unnamed city until he is arrested and subjected to the brainwashing techniques of the state. The nature of human criminality, morality and free will are all tackled by Burgess in one of his shortest novels. The beginnings of Anthony Burgess as a clockwork orange lie in a complex jumble of influences. From as early as the 1930s, while a student at the University of Manchester, Burgess had been reading about prospective futures in books such as The Time Machine by H.G. Wells and Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. These books depicted futures that challenged the utopian views of writers such as William Morris and Thomas More, where scientific progress may lead to a more efficient society, but not necessarily a happier or more human one. Yet Burgess's inspirations were not solely literary. His religious upbringing was dominated by the discipline of the Zaverian brothers during his school years, and the conflict between Augustinian Catholicism and Pelagian Catholicism is something that underpins much of his dystopian writing of the early 1960s, including the novels A Clockwork Orange and The Wanting Seed. Here, Burgess explains these notions. The terms Pelagian and Augustinian, though theological, are useful for describing the poles of man's belief as to his own nature. The British monk Pelagius, or Morgan, both names mean man of the sea, was responsible for a heresy condemned by the church in AD 416, which nevertheless has never ceased to exercise an influence on Western moral thought. The view of man which it opposes appears to most people monstrously implausible, even though it is part of traditional Christian doctrine. The view states that man enters the world in a state of original sin, which he is powerless to overcome by his own efforts alone. He needs Christ's redemption and God's grace. Pelagius denied this terrible endowment. Man was free to choose salvation as much as damnation. He was not predisposed to evil. There was no original sin. Nor was he necessarily predisposed to good, The fact of total freedom of choice rendered him neutral. These complex ideas of religious freedom and sin are melded in the novel with ideas of discipline learned by Burgess from his time at Zavarian College and in the military in World War II. Burgess hated life in the military, and throughout all of his war postings, he claims to have rebelled by being out of shape and scruffy in the face of military regime. Also during this time, he was reading other dystopias, particularly The Aerodrome by Rex Warner, the story of a fascist and militaristic regime consuming a small English village. After the war, Burgess read two other books that would influence his writing in the early 1960s. 1984 by George Orwell, and perhaps more importantly, Brave New World Revisited by Aldous Huxley. Through Huxley's non-fiction book, he learned about emerging technologies of behaviour modification, brainwashing and chemical persuasion, much of which was taken from the theories of the psychologist B.F. Skinner. Much of this is discussed in more detail in the Burgess Foundation podcast on Burgess and Dystopia, and will not be repeated here but it is vital to mention the impact Huxley's Brave New World Revisited had on the genesis of A Clockwork Orange. Burgess saw the theories of Skinner and his Russian counterpart Pavlov as being dangerous to the idea of free will. The fact that both Skinner and Pavlov believed that there was a way of making individuals conform to the power of a governmental system or a majority populace disturbed Burgess a great deal. He further illuminates the influence of these theories. It was the sense of this division between well us and sick them that led me to write, in 1960, a short novel called A Clockwork Orange. It is not, in my view, a very good novel, 
too didactic, too linguistically exhibitionist, but it sincerely presented my abhorrence of the view that some people were criminal and others not. A denial of the universal inheritance of original sin is characteristic of Pelagian societies like that of Britain, and it was in Britain, about 1960, that respectable people began murmuring about the growth of juvenile delinquency, and suggest, having read certain sensational articles in certain newspapers, that young criminals who are bounded, or such exuberant groups such as the mods and rockers, more playfully aggressive than truly criminal, were a somehow inhuman breed and required inhuman treatment. Burgess lived away from Britain, in Malaya and Brunei for the last half of the 1950s, and when he returned, he noticed the emergence of a new youth culture. This was something markedly absent from his own youth, which was swallowed up by study and his military conscription. Around him, he saw acolytes of new rock and roll bands such as the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, and the reaction of the establishment to the new freedom of young people. The word teenager had come to mean rebellious in the nation's press, and in many ways a clockwork orange is articulating the fears of an older generation, the feral, priapic and violent youth. But it was not only the teenagers of Britain that influenced Burgess's descriptions of Alex and his droogs. Burgess claims that an incident where his wife, Lynn, was beaten and robbed by American GIs on a London street during the war inspired the gang violence in the novel. Also, in 1961, Burgess decided to take a holiday to Leningrad, a trip that would feed the composition of his most famous novel more than any other. It was this trip that inspired Nadsat, the language of the droogs. <laughs> What's it going to be then, eh? There was me, that is Alex, and my three droogs, that is Pete, Georgie and Dim. Dim being really dim. And we sat in the Corova milk bar, and making up our rasodox what to do with the evening. A flip, dark, chill winter bastard, though dry. The Corova milk bar it was a milk plus mesto, and your mate or my brothers have forgotten what these mestos were like. Things changing so scorry these days and nobody uh, very quick to remember. Newspapers not being read much neither. Well, what they sold there was milk plus something else. They had no licence for selling liquor, but there was no law yet against prodding some of the new vestiges which they used to put into the old Moloko. So you could peat it with Velocet or Synthimesque or Drencrom or one or two other vestiges which would give you a nice, quiet, or a show 15 minutes admiring Bog and all his holy angels and saints in your left shoe, with lights bursting all over your mosque. Or you could peat milk with knives in it, as we used to say, and this would sharpen you up and make you ready for a bit of dirty 20 to 1. And that was what we were peating this evening I'm starting off the story with. Nadsat, meaning teen in Russian, is a blend of Romany, Cockney rhyming slang, the language of the criminal underworld, the English of Shakespeare and the Elizabethans, armed forces slang, the Malay language, and of course the Russian language which surrounded Burgess in Leningrad, and of which he had learned a great deal before his visit to Russia. Nadsat itself was invented by Burgess in an attempt to make the novel timeless. He did not want to use the existing slang of British teenagers because he worried the novel would be out of date by the time it had been printed and published. Of this Russian influence, Burgess writes, Russian loan words fit better into English than those from German, French or Italian. English, anyway, is already a kind of melange of French and German. Russian has polysyllables like Zhivotnoye for beast and Ostanovka to wuza is not so good as bus stop. But it also has brevities like brat for brother and grut for breast. The English word, in which four consonants strangle one short vowel, is inept for that glorious, smooth roundness. Grudies would be right. In the manner of Eastern languages, Russian makes no distinction between leg and foot, noga for both, or hand and arm, which are alike ruka. This limitation would turn my horrible young narrator into a clockwork toy with inarticulated limbs. As there was much violence in the draft smouldering in my drawer, and would be even more in the finished work, the strange new lingo would act as a kind of mist 
half hiding the mayhem and protecting the reader from his own baser instincts. And there was a fine irony in the notion of a teenage race, untouched by politics, using totalitarian brutality as an end in itself, equipped with a dialect which drew on the two chief political languages of the age. The NADSAT language caused some problems with the Clockwork Orange's publishers. James Mitchie, Burgess's editor at Heinemann, felt that the reader would need help to acclimatise to the unfamiliar prose, and urged Burgess to make it gently accelerando. He said, you can't throw too much of it at them too quickly, because otherwise the dumber ones among them will think this is too difficult. Burgess agreed, and began to make amendments to the opening chapters. Hence the small pieces of linguistic assistance seen in this section of the first chapter. The four of us were dressed in the height of fashion, which in those days was a pair of black, very tight tights with the old jelly mould, as we called it, fitting on the crotch underneath the tights. This bid to protect, and also a sort of a design you could very clear enough in a certain light, so that I had one in the shape of a spider, uh, Pete had a, a ruka, uh, and that is. Georgie had a very fancy one of a flower, and poor old Dim had a very hound and horny one of a clown's lit so face, that is, dim not ever having much of an idea of things, and being beyond all shadow of a doubt in Thomas, the dimmest of we four. Then we wore wasty jackets without lapels, but with these very big built-up shoulders, plechos we called them, which were a kind of a mockery of having real shoulders like that. Then, my brothers, we had these off-white cravats which looked like whipped-up cartoffel or spud, with a sort of a design made on it with a fork. We wore our hair not too long, and we had flip horror show boots for kicking. The linguistic inventiveness of A Clockwork Orange fits with Burgess's themes of the oppressive state and the brainwashing discipline of Ludovico's technique. It is a language of opposition, something that establishes Alex and his droogs as a group in isolation from the dominating culture of their time. Burgess's use of Nadsat makes this clear, even before the first act of violence is described. Despite the language, and the influence of everything from Burgess's school days to psychologists' theories, the real motor that drives the plot is Alex's love of violence. Far from being the countercultural hero that viewers of Stanley Kubrick's film have made the character, Alex in the novel is a 15-year-old villain, gleefully dishing out brutal beatings and destroying private property. At one point, Perhaps one of the most disturbing moments of Alex's behaviour, he grooms, drugs and rapes two ten-year-old girls. This violence should not be viewed as gratuitous in the novel. Burgess is using Alex's love of brutality to juxtapose ideas of sin with images of the so-called ethical mode of living. Alex is capable of great evil, but his love of classical music suggests that he also has an intelligent and sensitive capability. The way Alex describes music in his narration suggests a more complex internal life than that of the single-minded villain. Here, Alex is listening to Beethoven. Then, brothers, it came. Oh, bliss, bliss and heaven. I lay all Nagoy to the ceiling, my Gulliver on my rookers on the pillow, Glazzy's closed, rot open in bliss, slushying the sluice of lovely sounds. Oh, it was gorgeousness and gorgeosity made flesh. The trombones crunched red gold under my bed, and behind my Gulliver, the trumpets three-wise silver flamed. And there, by the door, the timps rolling through my guts and out again, crunched like candy thunder. Oh, it was wonder of wonders. And then, a bird of like rarest spun heaven metal, or like silvery wine flowing in a spaceship, gravity all nonsense now, came the violin solo above all the other strings, and those strings were like a cage of silk round my bed. Then flute and oboe bored like worms of like platinum into the thick, thick toffee gold and silver. I was in such bliss, my brothers. P and M in their bedroom next door had learnt now not to knock on the wall with complaint of what they called noise. 
I had taught them. Now they would take sleep pills. Perhaps, knowing the joy I had in my night music, they had already taken them. As I slushied, my glazzies tight shut to shut in the bliss that was better than any synth mesk, bog or god. I knew such lovely pictures. There were Vex and Petitzas, both young and starry, lying on the ground screaming for mercy, and I was smacking all over my rot and grinding my boot in their litzos. And there were Devochkas ripped and creeching against walls, and I plunging like a schlager into them. And indeed, when the music, which was one movement only, rose to the top of its big, highest tower, then, lying there on my bed with glazzies tight shut and rookers behind my gulliver, I broke and spattered and cried, Ah, with the bliss of it! And so the lovely music glided to its glowing close. Burgess is very clear that the violent subject matter of A Clockwork Orange makes the novel anomalous in his corpus, and claims no special interest in violence. It is the philosophical import of the novel that means the discussion of violence is not simply designed to shock or upset. Ludovico's technique, the Skinner-esque brainwashing of Alex, presents complex philosophical questions on the nature of morality and evil. Here, Burgess explains his motivations. Alex is not only deprived of the capacity to choose to commit evil. A lover of music, he has responded to the music, used as a heightener of emotion, which has accompanied the violent films he has been made to see. A chemical substance injected into his blood induces nausea while he is watching the films, but the nausea is also associated with the music. It was not the intention of his state manipulators to induce this bonus, or malus, it is purely an accident that, from now on, he will automatically react to Mozart or Beethoven as he will to rape or murder. The state has succeeded in its primary aim, to deny Alex free moral choice, which to the state means choice of evil. But it has added an unforeseen punishment. The gates of heaven are closed to the boy, since music is a figure of celestial bliss. The state has committed a double sin. It has destroyed a human being since humanity is defined by freedom of moral choice, it has also destroyed an angel. Alex's rehabilitation is a cynical and damaging one, something which is clear from reading the novel. However, there are two different versions of the story. The American edition of A Clockwork Orange ends with chapter 20. Alex has undergone brainwashing by the state and has found himself powerless against the violent world in which he lives. The novel ends with this paragraph, with Alex hearing Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Then I was left alone with the glorious Ninth of Ludwig van. Oh, it was gorgeosity and yum, yum, yum. When it came to the scherzo, I could video myself very clear, running and running on like very light and mysterious nogas, carving the whole litzo of the creaching world with my cutthroat Britva. And there was the slow movement and the lovely last singing movement still to come. I was cured all right. In the British edition, there is an additional chapter showing Alex with a new gang of droogs. But this Alex, three years older than the boy at the start of the novel, is having doubts about his violent ways and appears to be undergoing a self-motivated and freely chosen rehabilitation. Burgess explains why this vital difference happened. The 21st chapter gives the novel the quality of genuine fiction, an art founded on the principle that human beings change. There is, in fact, not much point in writing a novel unless you can show the possibility of moral transformation or an increase in wisdom operating in your chief character or characters. Even trashy bestsellers show people changing. When a fictional work fails to show change, when it merely indicates that human character is set, stony, unregenerable, then you are out of the field of the novel and into that of the fable or allegory. The American orange is a fable. The British or world one is a novel. But my New York publisher believed that my 21st chapter was a sellout. It was very, very British, don't you know? It was bland, and it showed a Pelagian unwillingness to accept that a human being could be the model of unregenerable evil. 
The Americans, he said, in effect, were tougher than the British and could face up to reality. Soon they would be facing Vietnam. My book was Kennedyan and accepted the notion of moral progress. What was really wanted was a Nixonian book with no shred of optimism in it. It was the American version of the novel that was made famous when, in 1971, Stanley Kubrick adapted it into a film. While Burgess's book had been reviewed widely on release, it was not until the release of Kubrick's film that the story of Alex and his droogs became notorious and a focus of much controversy in the press. Yet Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange was not the first adaptation of the novel. That honour goes to Andy Warhol's 1965 film, Final. Warhol's film is such a loose adaptation of the source material that even people who have seen it should be forgiven for not realising that it is built on Burgess's literary scaffold. The film is presented as a series of images of brutality, beatings, torture and masochism, all performed by a group of men under the gaze of a glamorous woman. In its preoccupations with pornography and violence, it bears many of the oblique hallmarks of Warhol's work, along with a familiar cast of factory regulars such as Gerard Malanga, Edie Sedgwick and Ondine. The finished film is disturbing, contains unsimulated violent acts and is not very audience-friendly. There is a persistent rumour that Warhol bought the film rights of the novel for $3,000, yet there is no record of this transaction and Burgess's later contract with the producers of Kubrick's version gives them sole and exclusive film rights. It is very likely that A Clockwork Orange was passed around the factory and Warhol, along with the writer Ronald Tavel, produced a piratical film adaptation after being inspired by the thematic connections between Burgess's novel and his own work. Vinyl is little seen, and it would take Kubrick's later adaptation of the novel to turn it into the cultural phenomenon it is today. Inevitably, Burgess and his novel were caught up in the press reaction to the film, something the author had mixed feelings about. What I would really like to see is a film of one of my other novels, all of which are singularly unaggressive, but I fear that is too much to hope for. It looks as though I must go through life as the fountain and origin of a great film, and as a man who has to insist, against all opposition, that he is the most unviolent creature alive. The release of the film inspired a press frenzy, with headlines such as Hunt for Clockwork Orange Sex Gang and Garbage Disguised as Art is Still Garbage. The press reported on violent crimes with persistent references to the film, and Burgess was called on to defend both the film and the novel in the face of perceived copycat violence. The film's Alex, played by Malcolm McDowell, is a more sympathetic creation than Burgess's. As Christopher Ricks notes in his 1972 review of the film, Alex is the only character that is not presented as a caricature, and is the only character that the film is interested in. In the book, as Ricks writes, Alex was the only person Alex was interested in. In many ways, this explains why Kubrick's film has helped raise the character of Alex to a kind of cult hero. In the book, he is a murderous villain, yet in the film, many of Alex's more hideous crimes are either softened or omitted altogether. Kubrick changes the rape of the ten-year-old girls into a consensual threesome with two of-age ladies. All of this helps Alex become someone to root for, mischievous but charismatic. In essence, the film does not need the final redemptive chapter, because it already makes clear within Alex's character the possibility for redemption. But still, the film gained so much controversy that Kubrick took the unusual step of banning all screenings in the UK, something that further added to its cult appeal. Warhol and Kubrick's films were not the only notable adaptations of the novel. In 1987, frustrated by numerous unofficial stage adaptations, Burgess wrote A Clockwork Orange, a play with music. This play which closely follows the familiar story, is interspersed with songs that convert the Nadsat language into gleeful and celebratory lyrics. The songs are influenced by music hall traditions and the works of Beethoven, and are playful and funny, something that Burgess lets infect the play as a whole. At the end of the play, a man comes onto the stage playing Singing in the Rain on a trumpet. The stage direction clearly states that he should be bearded like Stanley Kubrick. He is promptly and violently kicked off the stage by the cast, who then launch into the final number. Here is one example, sung by a chorus of droogs from the play's opening. What's it gonna be? Yeah. 
these adaptations, Burgess found himself returning to A Clockwork Orange over and over again throughout his lifetime. The fact that it was his most famous book frustrated him, but it is too simple to say that he ended up hating the book and its many inspirations. The book has never been out of print, and its legacy can be seen in fiction, film, music and fashion. Bands such as Heaven 17 and Maloko have taken their names from the novel. A new order in the Libertines are among musical acts to write songs inspired by A Clockwork Orange. On film and television, Bart Simpson has appeared as a droog. Heath Ledger's portrayal of the Joker in The Dark Knight is influenced by Burgess's text. And Quentin Tarantino has claimed a key scene in Reservoir Dogs was inspired by Kubrick's version. In 2012, the novel gained a new lease of life with the publication of A Clockwork Orange, the restored edition, which reinstates Burgess's original text and includes a selection of interviews, articles, reviews and other previously unpublished material. Alongside this publication was the release of the interactive app for iPad, which contains video, music and audio recordings that sync to the text of the novel, among other treasures from the archive at the International Anthony Burgess Foundation. These publications coincided with the 50th anniversary celebrations of one of the most influential literary works of the 20th century, one that will continue to provoke and inspire readers in generations to come. The International Anthony Burgess Foundation podcast was written and narrated by Graham Foster. Readings were by Ben Jewell and Anthony Burgess. All of the music was composed by Anthony Burgess. For more information, visit www.anthonyburgess.org.